from the Accessibility Specialist in the Office of Human Rights and Equity Services. Um, I'd, want to, I'd like to welcome you all to um, the uh, International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Um, this is the first time I'm doing a public lecture. Last year we did a, a bit of a card, so we let me change things up this year and um, share some um, a bit more of a complicated uh, analysis around disability and uh, disability justice. So we've invited Emil Joseph uh, from the School of uh, Social Work to join us today. Um, but first off, I'd like to invite Mele Coleman to do official welcomes and to, to speak about a project that the Human Rights and Equity Services is um, fostering this year called Perspectives on Peace. Mila? Thank you very much, Aishi, and uh, welcome everyone. We're delighted to have you here for the McMaster University celebration of International Day for Persons with Disabilities. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be here, um, particularly because uh, it's a great way for us to uh, celebrate accessibility in our community and certainly uh, to have a great discussion uh, by Dr. Emil Joseph uh, in the School of Social Work. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the Director of Human Rights and Equity Services. Um, I uh, actually have five disabilities, uh, so I, uh, th this day is really about me and uh, people like me, and I'm celebrating all around. Um, but uh, the annual observance is uh, pro pro was proclaimed in 1992 by the UN General Assembly, and it has served as a basis for the world really to identify and celebrate the great contributions that persons with disabilities can make to our society, and also, more importantly, how we can create more inclusion. Uh, and a way to uh, ensure that people with disabilities are able to fully contribute and participate uh, in our society to the greatest extent possible. Um, since the UN proclamation, a number of societies have made, have made great advancement toward the inclusion of persons with disabilities. Uh, certainly in the 1990s with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the US was a, a great leader in terms of uh, promoting uh, the recognition of persons with disabilities uh, in public and private contexts. Uh, and also spurring um, uh, similar creativities in other contexts, uh, such as Ontario, uh, with the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or the AODA. Uh, it's certainly something that McMaster is very committed to, to ensure that we're reaching the goal of accessibility. Uh, the legislation has some timelines of 2025, which seems like a long time away, but it's actually not that long, long away from now, uh, and encourages uh, uh, large public and private institutions uh, to ensure that uh, the needs of persons with disabilities are met and also that uh, um, full accessibility uh, is promoted. And of course what we know from uh, accessibility issues that, is that it's not just for persons with disabilities but in fact everybody benefits from accessibility. Uh, and it's uh, certainly one of the goals of the AODA legislation to ensure that we start instilling a uh, culture of uh, inclusion uh, and accessibility for everyone. Um, as you mentioned, um, that uh, we're also uh, using this event to promote uh, the Perspectives on Peace campaign. It's an initiative that was launched by McMaster University President Patrick Bean, as well as the McMaster Student Union President Teddy Saul. Uh, it's a program that's intended to foster a dialogue around the root causes of conflict and to examine productive ways to uh, achieve social transformation. Uh, and look at the ways in which the global and domestic fit in, particularly as they manifest themselves uh, on the university campus. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Dr. Joseph's extensive work in the area of identity, mental health, uh, and neoliberal processes of racialization and identity, and see what the connection is uh, to global peace initiatives and, and how we can look at structural forms of violence uh, and how they uh, impact on vulnerable populations. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the School of Social Work here at McMaster University. He has an extensive research background in critical mental health, social justice, post-colonial theory and social work, critical race theory, violence, ethics, confluence, and historiography and social work. He holds a PhD from York University, a Master of Social Work from Wilfrid Laurier University. He also holds a BA in Psychology from the University of Waterloo, which means he's been in Southern Ontario for a long time for all this uh, education. So we're certainly glad that you landed here at McMaster University. It's a great uh, uh, addition to our faculty uh, complement. 
He brings to his research close to a decade of community mental health experience in assertive community treatment, supportive housing, crisis respite, early intervention, and governance settings. He was also awarded the 2012-13 Kent Howarth Archival Research Fellowship from the Archives of Ontario, and is recently a 2013-14 Nathanson Graduate Fellowship from the Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights, Crime and Security at Oscar Hall Law School at York. Uh, most recently, he's been involved in inspiring uh, dialogues within the Hamilton community around social inclusion uh, and institutional responses to race. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Emil Joseph as the guest lecturer for this 2014 Master University commemoration of the International Day for Persons with Disabilities. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Emil Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emil Joseph, and today I'm going to share with you some highlights of a, a paper I wrote on the legacy of colonial violence in the forensic mental health system, paying particular attention to the role of internal inquiry. I hope you find it interesting. Often, uh, the public hears about a tragic incident as reported by the media about someone diagnosed with a mental illness or identified with a mental health issue who has committed a crime. These media representations often present the person as violent, aggressive, uncontrollable, and unpredictable. We have many recent examples. In all cases, the opinions of psychiatrists, police, and attorneys are cited often in, in the case documents and in the media. In every case, we find that many pieces are left out. Often, the voices of the accused is not represented. Their social and cultural context are often glanced over. And the criminal justice and mental health system's use of physical or chemical restraint, course of treatment, or practices such as the deportation of those identified with mental health issues are also uh, rarely reported. Sometimes the violence perpetrated by the mental health system does find its way into the media. And unfortunately, this occurs only when someone has been seriously injured or even, even killed. We have the example of the murder of UK police officer John Henry by Tennis and Moby, where it was noted that, quote unquote, it took three sprays of CS gas to hit on the head with a metal pole and two taser stun guns with a 50,000 volt charge to finally overpower the killer. There's also the tragic death of Howard by a man diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia who was tasered up to five times and pinned to the ground by three security guards before he stopped moving. Never, and he never regained consciousness. This was in a correctional facility in, in, in Nova Scotia. The 24 year old Michael Jacobs who was diagnosed with schizophrenia who was tasered to death in front of his family by Fort Worth police in 2009 and the tragic death of Ashley Smith who controlled <coughs> herself while being detained in Kitchener, Ontario while supervising staff did not respond. Even when these cases appear, the system is resistant to any significant transformative change. Internal inquiries are often conducted by people who work within these very systems and often reinforce the need for coercion and cite the testimony of expert psychiatrists or legal experts to verify the unpredictability of the patient as cause for the incident. And these cycles of violence are, are then left to continue. Sometimes biomedical psychiatric interventions have a long, have been described as having a long history of using or relying on biomedical diagnoses and treatments in order to exercise control over socially constituted marginalized groups by medicalizing deviance or to control for 
a dominant desire in social behavior and to advance colonial progress. Many of these contributions we owe to the psychiatric survivor, ex-patient, madman. Uh, as Robert, Robert Whitaker described in 2002, many biomedical psychiatric humans are often forced upon patients without a full understanding of their consequences and side effects. What is less often discussed or researched is the disproportionate use of harmful and forced treatments, criminalization and deportation for racialized minorities within the mental health system. The historical and political context of these exclusions as well as the exclusion of the voices of racialized people identified with mental health issues has not been adequately explored in the existing research and literature. In the past, research on racialized minorities with mental health issues has focused on biological, social, or psychological factors, such as risk factors for psychosis, health disparities, problems of access to mental health services, rates of, of self-harm, prevalence of symptoms. This limitation within the research neglects the disproportionate use of harmful and forced treatment, criminalization, and deportation for racialized people within this forensic mental health system. This limitation also creates an illusory void which allows for society to ignore the violence that the system itself perpetrates while advancing the reputation and professional expertise of disciplines and laws that claim a project of mental health and well-being. In this talk, um, I'll attempt to explore the question of how this system maintains dominance in mental health, even though this violence continues. I will argue through the problematic of the treatment of racialized people diagnosed with mental illness that regardless of the outcome of treatment within psychiatry, the mental health system, including its laws and disciplines with its dogmatic adherence to and reliance on alleged expert testimony and internal inquiry, this allows for the erasure of the voices and experiences of people diagnosed with mental illness. This creates a system that's impermeable to criticism where, where violence continues to prevail. These technologies of violence often own inheritance to the dispersive practices and disciplinary agendas developed during colonization that, when ignored, can only act to continue the dehumanizing outcomes upon which they were built. The intersections between or confluence between the mental health system and the criminal justice system is typically referred to as the forensic mental health system. Researchers have pointed out that there is this disproportionate representation of racialized minorities within forensic psychiatric systems, and I've suggested that racism exists both within the diagnostic process and within forensic psychiatric services. And researchers service and among male defendants in the forensic mental health system in Massachusetts, uh, blacks were more likely than whites to be, to be referred for an additional inpatient evaluation in a strict security facility, regardless of diagnosis or criminal charges. Also, a recent Canadian report described having a mental illness and being a person of color are factors that can increase the likelihood of criminal contact and conviction and subsequently made one a target for removal from Canada. As these examples highlight, the disproportionate criminalization and deportation of racialized minorities with mental health issues continues to be a significant issue and one that continues to exercise racialized violence. The associations between violent crime and mental illness have long been debated. Studies have demonstrated that this association does not have any sort of empirical support, and sometimes violence is actually slightly negatively associated with mental illness. The risk assessments used for violence often use symptoms of mental illness, such as delusions and hallucinations, as direct indicators of risk for violence, an embedded stigmatizing assumption that connects delusions and hallucinations to violent crime. And these risk assessments are then used to determine whether a person's basic human rights can be violated in the name of 
public safety. In forensic criminal health, the violence erasure of the larger social, political, and historical context for a person are a regular practice in, in diagnostics. The biomedical model of psychiatry has been criticized by others uh, over decades for reducing an individuals or a family into an object, ignoring the individual or family's subjective experiences, and neglecting issues as being extraneous to any perceived problems. Violent ratios have become conventional on a violent inheritance to a long history of dehumanization uh, within colonial projects. When we talk about uh, colonialism, we're referring to a historically established and enduring process whereby colonies are built and 